Well, good morning, New Life. Welcome to another Sunday in which we get to gather and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Jason. I am the youth pastor here at New Life Community Church, Holbert. And I just want to extend a hearty Sunday morning welcome to you as we take the next few moments to press into the Lord's presence. Today we are blessed to have the Homer Glen worship team uh, lead us in worship this morning. So the uh, people from New Life Homer Glen will be leading us in worship. But I hope that you will, just as, we, just as it would be if it was um, our worship team here at Hobart leading us in worship, I hope that you will still uh, worship the Lord in spirit and truth as they lead us. I want to encourage you also, um, sometime over the next few moments, just take a minute to let us know that you are joining us this morning. Uh, you can check in either on Facebook or YouTube, or you can visit newlifehobart.org, and there you will find a virtual uh, connection card in which you can also use that to tell us how you are responding today, to today's message um, or prayer requests or whatever you might have that you need to share with us this morning. Today we will continue our message series called Made for More, which is a study through the book of Ephesians. And Pastor Dan will be taking us into Ephesians chapter 3 uh, for this morning, so I hope that you are looking forward to that. And then lastly, I want to remind you of our virtual cafe that will be taking place right after the service this morning. And this is just simply a time where you can check in with people and, and see each other face to face and uh, let us know how you're doing and, and really just spend some time in a virtual type of fellowship um, and just uh, get to see each other, like I said, and, and give us updates on how you're doing. So as we move on today, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and commit this uh, next few moments up to Him. So let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank You so much uh, for this day that You have given us. We thank You for allowing us to gather and worship this morning, even through an online vir environment. And God, we do pray that in all things today, that You are glorified, and God, that You are um, taking center stage in our lives. We pray, Lord, for the message today that we hear from Pastor Dan. We pray, Lord, that it would find ready hearts, and Father, that it would produce abundant fruit in our lives. We commit all these things to you, and we pray it in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. All God's people said, Amen. Oh, come on, we're going to worship the Lord together this morning. Here we go. Sing out this song of praise Let our hearts rejoice For you are great Nothing in this world compares to you Cause all our hope, our hope is found In your presence I am free In your presence I am free Lord, all that I am belongs to you Every breath I have I give to you
Come and fill this place. Come and have your way. Come and fill this place. Come and have your way. Come and fill this place. Oh, fill it, Lord. Come and have your way. Come and fill this place. place let your glory come and move lord have your way come and fill our hearts with joy we can't contain in your presence i am free holy spirit you are welcome in this place let your glory come and move lord have your way come and fill our hearts with joy we can't contain in your presence i As Pastor Dan continues our series today on Made for More, today he's going to be teaching out of Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to go ahead and read the entire chapter. And as I'm reading, I would encourage you to go ahead and follow along as I read. So this is what we're going to be learning about today in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And it says this, When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles, Assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending His grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God Himself revealed His mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by His Spirit He has revealed it to His holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Jews and Gentiles who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and, and both enjoy the promise of blessings by, because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving Him by spreading the good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, He graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's promise in all this was to use the church to display His wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please, don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. And when I ask of all this, I fall to my knees and Pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And at this point, I want to pause and I want to say that I would like to invite you to go ahead and, and pray this prayer with me that the Apostle Paul gave to the church in Ephesus. And so let's pray this together with one heart and one mind and one accord. Starting in verse 16, it says this. Let's pray. I pray that from His glorious, unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep His love is. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able, through His mighty power at work within us, 
to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so as we have just prayed that together and as we have reflected already on Ephesians chapter 3 and as we move into this time of communion, I want you to remember what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18 that, that we may have the power to understand how, how wide and how long and how high and how deep God's love is. So much so that during this time of communion, we, we take the opportunity to remember his sacrifice for us on the cross. How he, how he died and, and, and bled out and how he suffered so many things so that we could be in a restored, reconciled relationship with God. And so may we remember how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is for us. And so before we partake of, of, of the bread and of, of the blood today, I just pray that we would remember what Christ did for us on the cross. And so before we partake of the elements of communion today, let's pray remembering who God is and his love for us and his continual faithfulness even to us today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, as we partake of these elements today for communion, I pray, we pray that you would be honored and glorified, that we would remember that, that, that this bread is your body that was broken for us and that the, this juice, the, this wine that we drink is the blood that was poured out as a new covenant in our relationship with you. And so, Father God, may we remember your sacrifice. May we remember your deep love that was poured out on the cross where you died so that we, who were dead in our sins, would have life in you. And so, Father God, bless this time as we reflect and as we contemplate what you did for us. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 23, the Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. And in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. And so as you per partook of the bread and of the wine. May you remember what Christ did for you and I so that we could be in a loving and intimate relationship with him and with each other as God's people. And as we continue in worship and as we continue in our series in Ephesians today, may we remember that knowing that his love is so wide, that it's so long, that it's so high and it's so deep that he died for you and me. Without your love, slave to the darkness, if it wasn't for the cross, you have won with your kindness, chase me down when, when I was 
We continue our recalibration, our tune-up through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, a letter that is written about the church, uh, who it is, and how it operates in this world. I hope that it is challenging some of our perspectives, some of our uh, common ways in which we think about the church. I, I've called them paradigm shifts, uh, not two dimes, but... Uh, but the way that we think about something before we think about it, it's, it's the assumptions that we make, the way that we assume things are to be or uh, have come to be, we commonly hold then to be true. Uh, from chapter one, the first one that we looked at is how we define or describe the church. 
And, and so often we say things like, well, let's go to church, or our church meets at 10 on Sunday mornings. But the church is, is not a building. The church is a body. The church is not a program. The church is a people. The church is not an activity. The church is our identity. It is who we are. When the Apostle Paul uh, writes about Jesus filling everything in every way, like we find at the end of chapter 1 in Ephesians. Um, it's his body that does that. We do that. Um, as we spread out into the world, wherever it is that we live and learn and work and play, I do that. You do that. Uh, the mosaic of every Christ follower in all of our spheres of influence, as we mesh together, we're the ones who spread Christ everywhere. And, and so we look at our spheres of influence, and, and then Jesus, through us, is permeating the world uh, into every one of these places, into every nook and cranny of society, we like to say. Uh, there can be more Jesus because we, the church, are his body, and he goes with us wherever we go. Uh, there will never be more Jesus if we confine church to a building or a program. The place and the program are important. Now, don't misunderstand me. Um, there, this is how we're, we're equipped to fulfill the mission that God has given to us. What we talked about last week, um, having experienced our new birth and uh, being found then with this new life, living out this new life and are fulfilling our new role, that which Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verse 10. It says, for we are God's workmanship. It's that word from which we get the word poem. Remember, it's, it's the masterpiece. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And while the church is, uh, the church has a, a, the place and the programs need volunteers to serve those that come and take advantage of the place and the programs, uh, the real role is, is the mission for which God has prepared us. It's that which he has sent us out into. It's that which he's designed for us to live out wherever it is that we live and learn and work and play. The last half of Ephesians chapter 2, where we were last week, makes it clear that each one of us has a unique masterpiece mission for which God has created us. And, and he's also put us into relationship with one another so that, that all of our uniqueness gives testimony uh, through our unity as the body of Christ. Christ's body, a single body that has a singular purpose. It's to glorify God and, and to fulfill everything in every way, everywhere. That's chapter 1, verse 23. Well, what motivates all that? Think about, think about all the things that motivate us for church, as the church. What would you put on the, the short list of motivators? Well, maybe it would include things like a, like a sense of obligation, uh, because you've heard that you should. Or maybe there's a sense of inspiration. Uh, somebody is has cast vision and it's caught your imagination and, and, and you want to be involved in the expansion of Christ's kingdom. Or, or maybe it's an awareness of a need. Uh, because if, if you don't, who will? Uh, and then there's peer pressure. A friend of yours has gotten involved and they beg you to come along and be a part of it. And why not? What else do you have to do? And so, and so you, you join in on what somebody else that is a friend of yours is doing. Or maybe you, you participate, you volunteer at church because, because you got, want God to bless you. You want to experience the, the favor of God. <laughs> or maybe 
you volunteer at church because you don't want God to get you. <laughs> You're sort of afraid. You're, there's that fear of God because he has expectations for you. The problem with any, probably all of these reasons is that they're going to fade. Some are going to fade faster than others, but, but you'll finally get to the place where you've done just about everything the church has asked you to do or that the church offers for you to do. And, and you'll get to that place in life where you, where you can honestly say, been there, done that. It's time for somebody else to take their turn. That sound familiar? Well, it, it may be that, that even none of those things in which you've participated in over the years was really God's masterpiece mission for you. And so you can spend out the balance of your life having served the church in a multitude of ways, going like, well, I, I, I'm glad I was able to help, but that really wasn't all that fulfilling. We're going to take a look next week at how it is that you can discover a masterpiece mission that God has for you. And I hope that you can be with us because it can set you free. It can, it can ignite your life to live with a sense of purpose and purposefulness that maybe you've never ever experienced before. But that'll have to wait till next week. Before that, foundational to the what is the why. Because if your motivation isn't adequate, um, you'll not do anything for very long. Uh, not your own goodness, not even God's goodness or favor upon you, his promised blessing, especially not a guilt trip, is going to do anything for you. We're going to get you to do anything for very long. Uh, this is what Paul prays for us as we begin Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, it's about the right motivation. And he says in verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then, and then right away he gets sidetracked with an explanation of his ministry to reveal this mystery that is being made known. A mystery, that's the word mystery he uses four times in this paragraph. It's, it's not about that which is unknown, but it's in Scripture used about that which God reveals which has previously been unknown to man. And so Paul reveals this mystery that he's been entrusted to share. And it's really that the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ is equally applicable for Jews and Gentiles. And beyond the salvation, it has to do with the mission that he has purposed for us. There would be uh, that there would be no no ethnic division, that there would be no exclusiveness in the body of Christ, in the family of God. It's not the focus of this message, but, but as an aside, uh, I want to make the honest observation that, that we live in a world that is still full of all kinds of division. Much of them are ethnic. People look at people's race and and they make assumptions and divide themselves according to those divisions. But it's not the only way in which we divide ourselves up. We, we divide ourselves up economically. And so there's, there's the social classes, the upper class and middle class and lower class, we commonly say. Or, or there's educational division. And so there are those that... Uh, don't have any education, those that have minimal education, those that have a high school education or a college degree or maybe some postgraduate work or those that pursue uh, multiple uh, doctoral work. And, and, it, and it tends to have impact on their place in society. So there can be these educational divides. But what God wants us to understand is that in in his family, there's, there's not to be any divide, that we're one. It has grieved me in these last few weeks to watch 
the situation unfold in Georgia and then just in the last few days this incident in Minneapolis, Minnesota that, that demonstrates in our society the tragic nature of, of ethnic divide, of, of racial hatred. And, and God would say there's no place for that in society, especially in the family of God. Because he says, look, verse 6, you're, you're heirs together, you're members together, you are sharers together. And what does he mean by that? Well, he says we're, we're children together. We're born into one family. It's that which has taken place in the past based on what Jesus has done for us. But lived out in our experiences, we trust Christ as our Savior. We're born into the same family. And then, and then he says, we're a congregation together. We're, we're living life as one body. This is our present current experience. This is the sharing with one another, the fellowship that we enjoy, the fulfilling of the one another commands that he has given to us. And then that we're to be citizens together. We're looking forward to one kingdom. And that will be in the future when God wraps everything up and draws us into a oneness before him as one people, his people, in his kingdom. Well, that's the interruption that, that Paul uh, has for himself. He interrupts this prayer, and so in verse 1 he had said, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of the Gentiles. And he's going to pray, and he starts again the very same way in verse 14. This uh, interruption, I, I hope we can come back and deal at some point with, with our oneness in Christ Jesus because it's such a powerful message. The fact that, that God has called us to, to break down the barriers, to, to break down the walls of division that keep believers apart. But our focus today is, is on the intercession, Paul's prayer, and he picks it up again in verse 14 where he says the very same thing. And, and he prays for these Jewish and Gentile believers who have, who have been united into one body. That which is uh, each with their, their masterpiece mission that would fully and personally experience a motive, that they would personally experience a motivation um, that would fulfill their purpose. It's a prayer for more love. I want you to pick it up with me in the middle of verse 17. This is where we see this part of Paul's request for us. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Again, let me read through that a little bit more slowly and with some commentary along the way. And I pray that you, uh, this is you as one who is individually God, a God-created masterpiece rooted and established in love there it is the motive is love it's it's where we're to be rooted it's an agricultural term and it's where we're to be established it's an architectural term it's it's the foundation of a building and and so life and ministry is to be marked by love that is rooted and established, foundationally reinforced in love. God's love. And, and experienced collectively with other believers. That's why fellowship and worship and sharing and ministry together are, are so important as part of the body of Christ. Because we are, do so together with all the saints. And then we read about this four-dimensional love to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And Paul, 
Paul uses something of, a, of an oxymoron here in, in his expression in this verse uh, as he describes our interaction with this love. <laughs> he says that we may know the unknowable. <laughs> Imagine that. How is it that anyone can know that which cannot be known? We as, as finite created beings, even as, as God's masterpieces, are to comprehend, are to understand intimately, are to experience. We are to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It's too big. It's too awesome. It's too grand to understand that you may be fulfilled, fulfilled, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And here we have another impossibility. Because how big is God? Well, he's, he's infinitely big, isn't he? And, and how big are you? Well, well, you're infinitely small by comparison. And so, so you are to put all of God's infinity into your finiteness to experience all of that, that love that he has in, in measureless ways into a very small container. This is the picture of, of what it motivates us in your, in your masterpiece mission. The, the unending, ever-expanding, wide, long, high, deep love of God flooding over your life. Filling you. Overflowing out of you to others. Can you picture it? It's this, it's this extravagant love of God that we are to experience and then to express. We grew up singing, at least singing to our kids probably, that little chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Have you ever sat with that truth? Have you ever let it just wash over you? Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Do you really believe it? Do you really, really believe that? That's what is to motivate our ministry. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And when we absorb the love of God, more love, God's infinite love, it will, it will overflow from our lives, it will spill out of our lives, it will flow through our lives. Again, the love of Christ that is wide and long and high and deep. You see, ministry, our, our living out our masterpiece mission is, is fueled by our life in Christ. Christ in you. The one who is, is beyond measure who resides in a very limited person whom he created and all of his love with him. It's not what we do a few hours a week. It's the way that we are to live 24-7. We don't need more pep talks or guilt trips to get us involved in ministry. 
<laughs> no, what we need is more love, more love. To sink our roots deep, to bury our foundation deep in God's love. Then what is visible to others above the ground will be the trunk and the branches and the fruit that is born that comes out of that deeply rooted life and ministry in the love of God. What begins to get built above ground is perhaps this, this growing tower or perhaps a, a network of buildings that would spread out across the earth. And, and, it, and it feels like God's love invading the world because it is. He is, through us, filling everything in every way, everywhere. It is love that motivated God's work. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 And then in 1 John 3.16, we see that it's also this love that motivated Jesus' work. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And it's to what motivate what motivates our work. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For Christ love compels me. No other motivation will endure. So if you find yourself waning in motivation for involvement in ministry a bit, then return to absorbing the extravagant love of God. I'd encourage you to sit down at your computer with your tablet and, and just fill up the screen with expressions of, of God's love. Or if you're part of my generation, fill up a yellow page of a yellow pad and just write and fill it up. Quite honestly, it'll take a lot of yellow pads. Was it the hymn writer of the love of God that says, if all of the stocks on earth were quills and the ocean was the ink and the sky were the parchment, I would run out as I describe the love of God. If you have trouble filling a page, then, then maybe it's time to sit before God and say, God, would you, would you remind me? Would you refresh my memory? Would you Help me to understand the, the evidences of, of your love for me. Soak in the extravagant abundance of his love. And so as your reservoir of love fills, it's going to, it's going to begin to spill over into the lives of, of those around you. In fact, it's like a, it becomes like a, like a spring bubbling up from within you. More love. It answers the why question. Let me leave you with four questions for personal reflection and application. Uh, you can walk through these together before the Lord or, or perhaps in a, a small group or with a friend, but, but answer these questions without using the words of the text, but based on the text, the last part of, of Ephesians chapter 3 in particular. How would you describe God's love? How would you describe God's love? And then, how have you personally experienced the extravagant love of God? Third question, because we're to love others that way, aren't we? So how do, how do your expressions of love need to change and grow to be like God's? And finally, how, where, and when do you have opportunity to love others extravagantly? That's my prayer for you. 
That is my prayer for us, that we would be known as the people of God, wherever it is that we go, in the block where we live, in our own neighborhood, where we work, where we learn, where we play, in each of these spheres of influence where God has placed us, as a local congregation in Hobart, Indiana, how are we expressing the love of God? When people think of you, when people think of us, are we known as a people who love God, through whom the extravagant love of God flows like a river? Let me pray that for you. Father, we come so grateful for the privilege that is ours of, of knowing you, of having come into relationship with you. And for those that may be watching this morning that don't yet know you in that way, might this be a day in which they would come to experience your extravagant love for them, recognizing that what we couldn't do for ourselves to, to satisfy the debt of our sin, you did in sending Jesus to die in our place. And then, Father, having experienced that, having trusted that, having accepted that, that we would live in such a way that your love flows freely through us to make a difference in this world. So continue to do your good work, both in and through us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God's very best to you. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Walk change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come. To pass, my heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still in now. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your again oh you promise more your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence
I've seen you move I've seen you move You move the mountains And I believe I see you do it again You made a way When there was no way And I believe I see you Well, New Life family, we come to the end of another service this morning. And I just want to extend a hearty uh, a note of thanksgiving to our uh, team from Homer Glen that has led us through a uh, time of music this morning and singing and leading us into the Lord's presence that way. I also want to take a moment to remind you, um, as I said earlier, right after the service, virtual cafe. Uh, the link is going to be on the screen in the comments, so you can just simply click that and that will take you uh, right to our virtual cafe. I also want to remind you of the many details that are circulating in our New Life newsletter that comes out every Saturday. Once again, if you are not receiving those, it's because we do not have your email. So if you would, go ahead and email hobert at newlifechicago.org and we'll be glad to add you to the uh, email list for that newsletter. And then lastly, I just want to remind you that our work here at New Life Hobart solely depends on your giving. We are able to do what we do because of your generous giving. So I just want you to be reminded and encouraged that what you give does go a long way. It is making a difference for the kingdom of God. So if in any way you felt like, you know, during the season, Jason, I really just don't know if it's making a difference. Trust me, it is and that God is using it. To close our time together today, I want to read us by way of benediction. A passage that we heard earlier, this is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week, guys. We'll see you next Sunday for another time where we get to gather and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless.